there we go so this is Gordon Bowden who's going to be talking about the flight from justice of one Andrea Davidson who was allowed to escape from the country because she knows the secrets of the arms to Iraq scandal and even although she is involved in huge con domestic frauds that have cost local people up to £700,000 each in no, 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 you have that wrong OK, let's hear it from Gordon a little introduction please Good afternoon <laughs> I will try to uh, correct you on your mistakes regarding um, Miss Andrea Davis Miss Andrea Davison uh, was running a virtual office business from Bangor, London, Vancouver, Canada, Rhodes Island, Cyprus, Gibraltar, and, and many locations within London. And her documentation, which was uh, in her police criminal trial, was declared as a fake document factory. The documents Miss Davison manufactured were then used by major fraud networks operating in and out of Spain, Panama, uh, Cyprus. The, the, the type of fraud that you get for investing your capital into fake companies. Uh, most of them are classed as being advanced fee fraud where you would make an uh, um, upfront payment, thousands of pounds, and to get a uh, share certificates in virtual companies, basically, companies that don't exist. And that was the, the uh, where she was uh, involved since 1989, in my records, to become uh, part of a far larger network. Um, that's when she was raided on the 13th of the 1st, 2010, uh, by 19 Derbyshire police and a dog squad. At her Bangor residence, which was uh, under various guises, uh, a few of them being Manchester House, 32 Bangor Street, Y fell in Heli, Gwynedd, LL 564JD. And if anybody does a overview in a typical Google search, you will see the references to multiple companies operating out of that address. It came to my attention uh, as far back as 2001 that a common address which I traced back to Miss Davison's location, operated out of 788-790 Finchley Road. And by backtracking the company, I then found her address. And then I proceeded for four months to write up a dossier recovering the companies, their directors, the scams that operated out of that address, uh, of which the Derbyshire Police placed no interest in 2006 and hence my frustration with the police in their inability to close down billion pound boiler rooms of which Miss Davison formed a very significant part of. Many of those companies are, can be associated to very senior politicians and members of the House of Lords, hence a protective cover uh, much the same as um, if people might recall uh, the major fraud um, where a certain gentleman was allowed to flee this country in a private plane to avoid being uh, arrested and detained for multi-million pound fraud. That same gentleman... Which gentleman is that? Are we allowed to disclose that? Well, I, I'll keep quiet in a moment. This trial is ongoing. Ah. Uh, that same gentleman uh, was also a financial donor and sponsor to the political satire magazine Scallywag, 
of which Miss Davison and her sidekick tag-along journalist Pete Sawyer were part of. They supplied the articles for the publication in Scabway. Now, you wanted to talk about um, the murder of Miss Alison Arridge's mother. Uh, she was Mrs. Sims, S-I-N-N-S. I have I've gone to retrieve a, a court bundle file um, to recover personal letters within the transcripts of our uh, court case file. Um, I can read you out a letter from Miss Davison uh, to Alison Arridge. It was dated the 24th of the 2nd, 1992. And she says, this is from Miss Andrea Davison to Miss Alison Arridge. Dear Alison, re Mrs. Sims, inquiries into your mother's alleged murder will be taking place in the near future, supervised by the Police Complaints Authority. The inquiry dovetails with other investigations in progress. The circumstances surrounding your mother's death, death are very suspicious. It is alleged that she was murdered for operational reasons by the enterprise, a section of a criminal and political organization to which certain police officers also belong. The enterprise supported and armed Iraq both before and during the Gulf conflict. The names of the police officers and enterprise agents allegedly involved are known. Obviously, your mother became involved unwittingly and innocently. As this uh, intimately concerns you, it is only fair that you are made aware of the position and are given an opportunity to be involved and comment. The above information is given in confidence, which is an essential caution. Regardless of any personal feelings you may have, it would be unwise to communicate this information to any third party at this stage. The issues involved are wide and very, and very serious. Because of this, I am unable to write further on the subject. Should you wish to communicate with me and view some of the evidence without any prejudice, I would be very happy to do so. If because of the nature of the inquiry you feel any trepidation, I assure you I shall, be, I shall forward to you in confidence updated results of the investigation concerning your mother as and when they become available. I trust you can appreciate that although I have been aware of the above circumstances for over a year, prevailing conditions over which I had no control have prevented me from advising you. And, and best wishes, Tara. Now, this is a letter, which is a copy of an original held by Miss Arridge, who forwarded that and many others to me, of which has been used in our civil case, of which we have um, been successful against Miss Davison. Um, these letters portray the involvement of Miss Davison within, within a network of international organized crime uh, syndicates operating worldwide who have very high political connections. And these records of these events were only in your files or had some of them been lodged with the police at that stage? I believe that they were entered into the civil case of Miss Arridge and her late husband against Miss Andrea Davison. Because a major part of the flight from justice of Andrea Davidson is the obfuscation. It's, uh, you've got to get the name right for a start. It's Davison, not Sorry. Davidson. She used Davidson as an alias as well. So that and about 15 other aliases. Okay. But this evidence was not confiscated by police officers at any... Oh, yeah. well, it was. I don't believe so. I have presented this to the Derbyshire Police, which sort of brought hackles up on the 
back of their neck because it showed total incompetence uh, with their transfer of intelligence to other major regional police forces because the police didn't even bother to go and see Miss Arridge, Alison Arridge, uh, to uh, uh, investigate her involvement with Miss Andrea Davison. But I, the risk is that if we go into this much detail with the story, we won't get around to the murder issues and the dumping okay. of the corpse. All of that has been covered up by the UK police, the Derby police. Uh, the all of them, because they were all uh, advised. The Derby North MP, Chris Williamson? Oh, yes. Yeah. So could you just give us a brief narrative on the reappearance of the disappeared Mrs. Alison Sims? Yes. And how she no, was found Alice, on... It wasn't Alison Sims. I haven't got this the uh, Christian name. Oh, obviously. okay, sorry, Mrs. Sims, Alison, Alison Arridge's mum. Correct. Can you tell that story concisely so the listeners can get the gist of what exactly happened in that brutal case? I was informed on the telephone by Miss Arridge herself that um, prior to her mother being found, it was three months prior to, um, Miss Arridge woke up uh, after, this was after her husband had passed away, um, that she woke up in the early hours of the morning with a, a draft, the door was banging, her bedroom door, and she woke up and she went to go and close the door and looked into the bedroom of her elderly mother and found she was missing. She then went down the stairs, the front door was open, and she looked out into the courtyard and Andrea Davison's car was also missing. The, uh, the North Wales Police then um, were informed and immediately they set up a search for Mrs. Ari uh, Mrs. Sims, uh, which extended for over three months. Uh, they had a police incident caravan uh, situated in a field quite a way away from the house. Um, and then I'm told uh, there was a disagreement uh, following the uh, Mrs. Um, sorry, Miss Andrea Davison sending that letter which I've just read out to you where Alison Arridge uh, confronted Miss Davison to say you know you should be investigated by the police given this letter and it appeared that the police paid, paid no significant uh, emphasis on that letter However, and we've not covered at any stage yet the close relationship between the two neighbouring family groups. Yes. Uh, because the, the, the awareness of the neighbour was particularly close because uh, Andrea Davidson had a severe attack of malaria and was cared for by the mother and daughter in a very conscientious manner, with no obligation, by the by the neighbours, the Arages and Miss uh, Sims, uh, that was in the lead up to this period, uh, and effectively, what happened after that <laughs> was that the lady who had been the carer for Miss Davison, not not, not in the permanent uh, manner just I'm as a just favor saying, to her um, she collapsed uh, in the, um, the next door house or the attached house where Miss Andrea Davison lived with her mother and Andrea Davison's mother just said leave her alone uh, when she collapsed she said if it's God's will she will live if it's God's will she will die however Miss Arridge called the ambulance and travelled with Miss Davison and it was to the local hospital where it was found out she she was suffering from a contagious uh, disease uh, said to be malaria and she was then taken uh, along with 
uh, Miss Allison Arridge to Birmingham to the Infectious Diseases Hospital where I'm told by Miss Arridge it was found that she had um, the highest count of malaria uh, trace in her blood. However, she successfully recovered and um, still there was this animosity by uh, Miss Davison against Miss Arridge, which then uh, progressed over many, many months when uh, Miss Davison took out a case, a civil case, against the late husband of Michael, uh, called Mike Arridge, and that case extended over five years in the civil courts. But going back to Miss Davison's uh, involvement, wh when Mrs. the senior Andrea Davison's mother. Uh, became a bit senile. Miss Andrea Davison put her into a local home and when she was in that home Miss Davison altered the deeds for the property which was in her mother's name and subsequently sold that property at less than its stamp value. This was all known to Andrea, uh, Alison Arridge who then provided me with uh, many uh, forensic documents which I have in the file and then uh, Miss Davison vanished uh, she was said to have gone to Cyprus and uh, been part of a larger network um, involved in money laundering and I will tell you that gentleman's name regardless of his trial uh, ongoing trial was Azil Nadir does that name ring a bell? Yeah, vaguely. Well, it's so it's taken a long time to tell the story about yes. the murder of the mother of Mrs. Sims, the murder of Mrs. Okay. Sims, so and the reappearance the police, of her body, which shocked me the other day when you told me it. The police hunted for Mrs. Arridge in a c condensed search using dogs, uh, aircraft, looking for the body, um, and eventually, after three months, her body was found on the hillside, less than 200 metres away from the police caravan. Now, if you know anything about uh, sniffer dogs, they are trained to sniff out decomposing bodies. Now, if the caravan was 200 metres away, as I'm told by Miss Alice and Harridge, they would have picked that up within seconds, if not a visual sight. And the visit in a posh car of Jonathan Aitken with Andrea Davison. Andrea what is the Davison. significance of that in this sequence of events? Well, after the body was found, um, there was uh, Miss Alison Arridge no, uh, heard a motor vehicle pulling up in the courtyard and looked outside and immediately recognised uh, uh, Jonathan Aitken as getting out of the car. Jonathan Aitken and Miss Andrea Davison uh, went f then for a walk and, and was followed by Alison Narridge at a discreet distance. And she noted that Andrea Davison took Jonathan Aitken to the very spot and pointed out to the spot where Mrs. Arridge, Mrs. Sims was found. They then went back to her property and uh, disappeared inside. But that's what I'm saying is that, that Miss Davison has some very powerful connections uh, in government. And could you quickly explain how the secret, the evidence on this case was taken from the police files and the case note number and how that eventually led to the flight of Andrea Davidson from this country because she had awareness of those bigger war crimes and the arms to Iraq scandal. Can you quickly, for the public interest, lead us through that in maybe five minutes or so? Okay. Miss Andrea Davison has always purported to be an ex-intelligence officer and portrayed herself to have been the intelligence advisor for the Department of Trade and Industry, the Select Committee. However, 
as an ex-member of Her Majesty's forces, I'm quite astute at uh, recovering documents, and I could find no trace of her, and even wrote to Sir Kenneth Warren myself, and many others to find out, and including Lord Doug Hoyle, to find out if at that time she was the appointed intelligence advisor for the select committee of the Department of Trade and Industry. I received no reply, and so I dug a lot deeper. From Andrea Davison's own declaration, that would have made um, that would have meant that during the period 1989 to 1992, the people in charge of that would have been Sir Kenneth Warren and his right honourable. I have a little list. MP Peter Lilly. Now I have confronted his right honourable MP Peter Lilly for details on whether Miss Davison was in fact the intelligence advisor to the Department of Trade and Industry and received no reply. I wrote two articles in a, a blog of which were removed by Mr. Peter Lilly. So that was that was in conjunction with Peter Eyre? No, that was all done by myself. All right. Um, then Miss Davison, uh, obviously, had not been heard of since 1992, when the letters I have, which I recovered from her website, www.afbio.co.uk, which were over 400 documents which has been used in our civil case. Uh, she went out of uh, focus on the public view until she was raided on the 13th of the 1st, 2010. And she was raided for running a fake document factory, fake passports, fake IDs, um, advanced fee fraud, romance scams. When I pr placed AF Bio into the search engines to get some yes. images for the video, I get yes. loads and loads of pictures of US militia men. Can you explain what AF Bio is and what the court case was about? The, what Andrea Davison's court case. All oh, right, sorry, I thought the AF Bio must have been a major financial scam. Did it involve the US? No. no. Okay. Miss Davison was running a uh, fake document factory where the documents used that she manufactured were used in uh, major international fraud groups from Spain who cold calls sold fake share certificates on multiple companies. Those companies were linked to Thailand and many other regions. That's Thailand which is all over the news for Correct. other reasons the week that we started to talk about this. Correct. Global no. financial fraud on a billion trillion dollar stage exactly. that's covered up by a military coup. Correct. By puppets for the Rothschilds although well, that I is think, speculative. I think that the military coup is in uh, a total um, reference to the military government deciding that the, the civil government was so corrupt that they decided to to cut their throat, so to speak, because they couldn't stand it anymore with the money being moved in and out of Thailand. So I would believe that the military coup is uh, is actually beneficial to stopping this network, uh -huh. this syndicate. And the passports that Andrea Davison issued were focused largely on Latin America which is where she eventually flew to? Well I believe they, they according to the trial evidence of which I have a full fraud group north case synopsis which we applied for under freedom of information request and received um, indicates that she had multiple stamps of government origin or fake government stamps, which were then used to forge passports, some of them being Venezuela, 
and to where I now believe she is uh, hiding. Okay. Uh, and how did she reveal that she was potent enough when she was facing prosecution for financial frauds on a massive scale in Britain and in other continents? How did she convince the powers that be and the conservative capitalist cronies that she was gonna reveal the secrets of the Iraq to the, the arms to Iraq scandal, which my is the my point would be if she had such important information and documentation, and especially on conservative members of parliament and senior politicians of the Conservative Party been involved in political paedophile rings, why did she wait until just after her arrest to release this information? I believe it was used as a blackmail tool. It makes perfect sense. It gets why, her her liberty. Why, why was there total silence from 1992 and what you just described in that earlier video that we made. Raided. Yeah. She didn't make a declaration that she had information uh, in, uh, important to the Chilcot inquiry until after she was arrested. Okay, that's good enough, Gordon. So the woman has never been taken to justice. She's in court cases for fraud, but there is no court case or any international scrutiny on her role as a whistle, potential whistleblower in the arms to Iraq scandal that you other profiled? Than, other than the documents which show that she um, communicated with Tony Blair, which I have, um, what's the other gentleman's name that's involved now? Uh, just bear with me two minutes. Rifkin as the foreign secretary in the re no, lead up no, to the Iraq no, conflict. No, no. Don't, don't uh, mistrack yourself. <laughs> um, Charles Clark. I don't, I've never heard of Charles Clark. Which office does he bear? Well, it's Clark in in government. Ken Clark. Sorry, Ken Clark. Okay. Ken Clark, Ken Thank you. Yeah. And so that's Ken Clark who condones rape under certain cir circumstances, 100%. And, and is the longest-serving member of the current Conservative cabinet. Yeah, and um, Neil Kinnock. Yeah. And Labour MP Peter Hayne. Those are the letters that I have of correspondence in the 1990s and 2010 when she warned Peter Hayne that the arms to Iraq documents had been seized by the Derbyshire police. And she warned Peter Hayne uh, to recall the letter that Peter Hayne put in his constituency safe concerning missing nuclear weapons or warheads and the Peter Lilly who you referred to earlier on the arms to Iraq issues has just been appoint reappointed as a special advisor to number 10 Downing Street within the last two weeks he, I'm not sure I'm not sure if you were aware be, of that oh I am aware and he should be facing 25 years in jail as a non-executive director of a Ponzi scam which uh -huh. is te Tethys Petroleum. Good lad, Gordon. We'll keep that for a different interview. Okie doke. Uh, but Anna, I think you should... I think you should... Can we just go through, because the Gamal Cairn crimes are incredibly topical at the moment, can we just make another video on the issues of the virtual oil and gas companies that are running out of Lothian Road in Edinburgh with links to Rifkind and to Chilcot? Yes, we can, but not. Uh, I think we should give it a break at the moment. Okay, I'll put those two videos online, and I'll get back to you, and we can have a little expose of 
all of those thousands of fraudulent companies that have no product in the virtual oil and gas sector which is now rising up as the fracking scandal to get the uninformed public all riled up about <laughs> things that are unrelated to fracking you mean yeah <laughs> It's all about the money trail and the politicians who lead us down that corrupted yeah. pathway. We'll talk about that this afternoon or later on in the week. Thanks for your help. Okay.